Number 10, Face Off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient? Radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need. Tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speedrunning strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief, who's a nuclear scientist, and he said that's not it. Number 9. Nail Biter There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, played or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats begin to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper, Ooh, stinky. That is not a win-win situation. That is, that's actually a lose-lose situation. Don't do that. That's gross. Number 8. Mini Brows Back in ye olde times, pale skin was in. And so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice. A lady's best friend, right? Yeah. Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck man, no. Number 7. Pucker Up Hey, on this channel we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back at the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which if you didn't know is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. Number 6. Boots with the Fur Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we had today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Number five, a whole lot of man. Well folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next. 
to the body tribes of Ethiopia, where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts, where the winner is declared a hero, and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. You can't just treat me that way. Number four, shark girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There are certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite, uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. Number three, the George Costanza. Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look, ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could. When I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, Give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the yieldy times needed to remove any of the list I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm going to do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said, it's not it. There you go. Hey, you said it. Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important, and this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist, stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste, coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. And this one literally did say it on the box, it was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong, or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me, please. 10. Liquid stockings. When most people think of war, they think of side A versus side B. Man with gun, shoot other man with gun. Simple, right? To most, yes. But the war departments and those behind the scenes know that the war is a logistical nightmare. Seriously. A lot of things on this list are because we needed to find alternatives. Millions of resources were pooled together to defeat the tyranny of fascism in World War II. Besides guns and ammunition, obviously, literally everything else is needed. Rubber, cloth, fabric, food, water, oil, grease, medicine, gas, men, and all kinds of metals. One of the things that was needed for the war effort was nylon, the same thing your grandma used for her stockings. So in Britain, when there was a shortage, the ladies did the next best thing and used a liquid to paint on their stockings. A classic example of keeping calm and carrying on. Way to go, ladies. 
It should be a bad idea though. If I started sweating on those, I'd have paint everywhere. It'd be really, it wouldn't be good, dude. It would not be good. Number nine, food rations. I know, but listen, you just aren't you when you're hungry. Nobody can tell me that they feel pretty on an empty stomach. Am I right? Maybe less bloated, but still, you're not your best. Sadly for people living at home during the war, food rationing was quite common. Meats, grains, dairy, pretty much everything was needed to feed the troops. My grandparents always tell the story of them growing up during the war and that they would trade in tins of grease collected at home for free entry into the movie theater, which kind of makes sense. Which if you ask someone from that time is a big deal. The grease had multiple uses in the military. There's lots of uses for it. There's grease, guns, you need grease. You need, you need, you need the grease. Anyway. Number eight, Rivet Rosie. Every lady out there right now, young and old, has different fits. I just wear what's clean and what makes me look like a stereotypical Canadian. I do a lot of plaid, that's just how it goes. When you get to the club, that's a different fit from the one you wear from going to work, right? Well, despite the glamour and the chicness of 1940s in Hollywood, a lot of ladies had to go to work. Men were at war. You gotta, you gotta, fill, gotta fill the quotas, gotta fill it. Can't exactly show up to the bomb factory in a tight dress and heels for a long day's work, now can you? No, wouldn't be comfortable. Number seven, red for victory. Mustache man hated red lipstick. Yeah, I didn't know that either. But when a scary dictator man says no lipstick, that means no red lipstick. Whew, don't wanna cross him. The Western allies took this to their advantage. Marketing for this got a huge boost. As wearing the cosmetics that the angry German man didn't want you to, was thought to be contributing to the war effort, and honestly, it was. This is also impartial to inventing pinup girls, or at least the whole culture for them. The ladies all dolled up to stick it to the man in the eagle's nest and gave the boys overseas something worth fighting for. That's right, ladies, show them what they're fighting for. Number six, close shave. This one goes out to all the guys out there that sucked at shaving the first couple times they had to do it. I'm just one of them. Heck, who am I kidding? I'm still pretty bad at it. Maybe you shaved too close and accidentally cut yourself. Shaved against the grain, or maybe you missed a couple hairs. That, that always happens to me. Keeping yourself groomed in the military is important. Ask any drill sergeant, they'll tell you. But can you honestly imagine trying to shave in a war zone? The only thing I would want to be doing is hiding or telling jokes. I would love to tell jokes in a war, but they don't exactly have private first class j jokers, do they? N no, they don't. I wouldn't last long, but yes, shaving was a part of military life. Completed with a tiny shave kit and mirror whilst under the watch of the enemy. No thank you. Number five, harmful products. Today, most folks are careful about what they put into them, but back in the day, not so much. When the war started, the military needed a lot of resources, like previously mentioned, and companies had to come up with alternatives. But when coming up with an alternative, testing may not have been done, or at least thorough. That means whatever they made could prove to be harmful to the user, like the radium girls from the First World War. Refer to my other video. My point is, this is a time when products that contain cyanide are sold on store shelves, so anything is possible which is just messed up. Watch what you're doing. Number four, good smoke. After a long day of receiving artillery and gunfire from German positions, a GI may not be looking himself, or probably doesn't feel himself either. Early stages of PTSD forming, most likely. So what can I do to improve this mood, they ask? And appearance. Why smoke a cigarette, of course, what else? Smoking culture was huge back then, and it wasn't seen by the public as a health risk. Lucky Strike cigarettes were packaged with soldiers' rations. They were given out cigarettes. It's just wild, you open up a can, there's my ham, there's my crackers. There's my smoke, so I'm good to go. Number three, nothing left. Unfortunately for a lot of cities in Europe, they got destroyed by bombing raids. Berlin in particular took a pounding. Pictures of the rubbled out city make you wonder how they ever rebuilt it. With that in mind, you can just imagine how beauty and fashion were the last thing on people's minds. Things like food, water, shelter, and fearing the sound of air raid sirens were more of a top priority. 1945 Berlin is not the place to head on down to the department store and pick out a new dress. You wear whatever you can find, and that's about it. Number two, strapped up. Bang, 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 bang. If you found yourself to be one of the lovely ladies of the French resistance, or really any resistance against the Germans during World War II, there was a good chance that you never left the house without your favorite accessory ladies. Yes, that's right. A firearm. Across many nations in Europe, secret underground rebellions were being organized to overthrow their invaders. Allied forces even airdropped simple made firearms to resistance so they could get access to a better one with the one they dropped. It makes sense. How very James Bond of you. Oh, yes. 
<sighs> Behave. Number one, clean nails. Keep your nails clean and short. It's something I love to do. My nails get too long, I go straight for the pair of clippers. Having clipped nails and less hair was a part of every GI's routine. Besides looking dapper in a trench, the real reason was in case of chemical weapons and any toxic residue getting caught in beards, hair, nails, just anything like that really. Would that work? I mean, sorta, of, but just not being exposed would be a lot better of an option. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you can enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, aka wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear, I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint. Just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s, so John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. Guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop, but the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic, and a dimple patch, oh, well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I do it for the clicks. I do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. 
You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. If you put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I applying? Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Matternich was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel and nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used Deadly Nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply Nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes Deadly Nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly Nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't. When in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well. Don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint, figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. Corsets would move your organs around slowly, and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? 
Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdrive, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, golden hair. Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing. Fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belongs in the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. Number nine, what a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations, built beautiful monuments, and were honestly just so smart, so smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something or did this like slip into a tub with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness? And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me, no thanks, I'm, I'm good, no, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight. Beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes, but how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty? In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt. Life is great. You got the pyramids. You got the Nile River. And you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Ugh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So, the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. Another dual purpose, as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age, and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks, as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus, 
Who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. Mario, Zelda, Little Mac. Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I could never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number five, rationing legs. World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's three o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma, but on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this, and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just gonna have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number four, bad hair days. All right, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s, because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology. Yet, we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s, and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it, but I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three, you do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I, I guess. Romans wanted a clean mouth, and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So, what do you use? We. Lots of we, specifically Portuguese we. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking, and you're giving that a swish in your mouth, well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it. It makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here. But all I'm gonna say is, the chief knows medicine, and he said this is a hard pass for me, and it ain't it. If you want to shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do, and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is, you can get very sick, and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is, well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why, that's just wrong. Oh man. Number 10, long neck. Look, this one probably isn't a surprise to anyone. There must be like 20 documentaries on the subject alone, but today we're talking about the long necked women found in some African cultures. In a nutshell, you pile on gold rings around your wife's neck until she's impersonating a totally winnable ring toss game at the county fair. The end result is a neck that's long just as the day is long. Pretty long. And in these cultures, this is considered very beautiful. Now, who am I to judge? 
I can't. However, as a lawyer, doctor, detective, and fireman here at Bumblebee, I'm going to not recommend the giraffe look. While at first glance it may look like the neck is being stretched, it's really the shoulders that are being dropped forcibly by having so many rings piled up on your neck. That's just that's not healthy for you. Anyone in the comment section that has played contact sport will tell you that dropping your shoulders like that is not good. I like my thick neck the way it is, thank you very much. Number 9. Lead Cosmetics Did anyone know we still sort of do this today? Are we insane? Lead has been used in makeup for an extremely long time. It was found in cosmetics back in classical antiquity, so that's as far back as the 8th century BC. In the 18th century though, women would mix lead with vinegar to make themselves look more and more pale, which was a beauty standard back in the day. Gotta love looking like you never see the sun. Now, while the white lead that was used wasn't easily absorbed through the skin, the mixture of white lead with other chemicals and ingredients to create makeup and other products did indeed cause lead poisoning. And even though people knew this, they continued to keep on using it? Number 8. Jiggle Machines Oh, the great effort people will go to not make any effort. The self exercisers or vibration machines were a popular fad back in the 1950s and 60s. The idea? Lose weight fast and easy with the help of modern science and machines. Trouble is, they, they don't really work at all. In a way, it's pretty similar to the snake oil men of the past. A common issue, a weird solution, and then a great marketing, well, that would make for a fad. Someone had to just make bank on it, I know they did. I mean, I get the appeal, I, I do. I wish I could be a 1950s housewife with a vibration machine, so I could be beach ready. But being a 1950s housewife means I'm so busy. But with a belt machine, it means I can keep my hands free, so I can reach for my favorite brand of menthol cigarettes and my third morning martini. Boy, I sure love this modern world. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Number seven, ear scoops. When I think of all the things I use a scoop for, I think of ice cream and sugar for my tea. Well now, I'm going to be thinking about how people in the Viking era, all the way to the later post Tudor times, used to scoop out their own earwax. Yes, an ear scoop was a tiny little brass or copper spoon with a twisted handle that went to a point. The spoon part was used for scooping, while the pointed end was used for pooping. No, I just wanted to say that. It was actually used for cleaning the fingernails of dirt. Thanks ear scoops, now I'm never going to look at a spoon the same way again. Number 6. Hangover Mask Ok, picture this. It's 1946. WW2 is over. Life's getting back to normal. You live in a major city, so you decide to take a night on the town with your friends. Well, one too many Manhattans later and, well, you're not even sure if you're still on the island of Manhattan. You have what the drinkers of the world call a hangover. Let me know in the comments without too much grim detail about your worst hangover. What was your poison of choice? I'm curious. Many men and ladies have found themselves in bad places in the morning after uh, so many drinks. Only if there was something to cure said hangover. Well ladies, you're in luck. The hangover mask aims to cure that. It's basically just a mask with plastic ice cubes. However, I'm going to get a little personal and say that every hangover I've ever had, I didn't need a face mask. I needed some water and a bucket since the bathroom was too far away. I don't, I don't know why your, would your face need to be cold? I don't really understand that part. I don't know. Number 5. Tooth Removal Here, I found this quote from a dentist in the medieval period who would travel from town to town. Take some newts, buy some cold lizards, and those nasty beetles which are found in fens during the summertime. Calcine them in an iron pot and make a powder thereof. Wet the forefinger of the right hand, insert it in the powder, and apply to the tooth frequently, refraining from spitting it off. When the tooth will fall away without pain, it is proven. Hey, if it is proven, who am I to say otherwise? Just some lowly YouTube host. If you weren't using your Newton Beetle powder to remove your tooth, then it looks like you're going the much more old fashioned tooth pulling route. And that was much, much worse. They had rudimentary anesthetics that was possibly used then, but you had to worry about bleeding and infection. I think I'll stick with my uh, beetle newt powder. Number 4. Rejuvenique Mask I got another mask for you guys, I know, but I saw this and I, I just didn't know what to think, honestly. It's a mask that you wear, but it's plugged into a battery pack and it sends pulsations to your face. After, of course, you've applied the toning gel. What the heck is toning gel? I don't know. This is supposed to tone your face apparently. Your jawline or 
I just feel like plunging your face into a mask that's hooked up to a voltage, uh, that's, a, that's just a bad idea. Oh yeah, and also a bad idea is the mask itself. Look at this thing, I mean, that's a heinous looking mask right there. You can come home from school one day and your mom's gonna be sitting at the kitchen table looking up Michael Myers. Oh, that's not okay. Please don't do horror movie beauty stuff, ladies. Please, no. I don't wanna be scared, I don't like scary stuff. Number three, Spit Black. Back in the roaring 20s, they had mascara, just like we do now. But unlike the little tubes of stuff we have, they had a block or cake of the stuff. To get it to a state where they could actually apply it to their lashes, they would need to add water. And what's the quickest form of water? That's right, it's your spit. The mascara cake stuff was made of soap and coloring, which you don't really want to put near your eyes. But then, knowing that people are using their spit to apply it, it's your own spit, so I guess if you're comfortable with that, you do you, pal, but makes me think of dudes using their saliva to like lick their eyebrows. Ick. Number two, sharp teeth. I like Shark Boy and Lava Girl just as much as the next guy. However, that doesn't mean I want to look and feel like a shark. This one just creeps me out. I, I, I don't hate the dentist, but I think everyone can agree with me that teeth getting drilled is just uncomfortable. It just kind of sucks. Especially if there's like powdered tooth in your mouth. That's just the worst. It's kind of gross too. I don't know. Well, what I do know, however, is that there are some cultures out there where the ladies get their teeth sharpened or filed. Oh yes, and there ain't no dentist office there either. This is bite the leather, you're in dad's kitchen kind of operation. Oh God. I would honestly talk more about it, but the editor's gonna show some pictures and I'm gonna have to stop because if I see him, I would just get queasy. I don't wanna see that stuff. I, I, no thank you, no teeth sharp. No, no. Number one, mercury laced skin cream. Secure Gorad's Oriental Cream and take your first step to a new lasting beauty. That's right, over time you too can develop dark rings around your eyes, lose some of those pearly whites, and get stunning black gums. That's because Gorad's Oriental Cream is made with calomel. What is calomel I hear you ask? It's a mercury compound. Yeah, it doesn't sound so good anymore, does it? While the women of the 1920s who used this product maybe once or twice would be fine, those who used it over long periods of time subjected themselves to mercury poisoning. But hey, Gorad's cream came in white, flesh, and whatever the hell color Rachel is supposed to be. Number 10, corsets. Hey, what's more lethal than being constricted by a garment that it really is unnecessary unless, well, unless you really need some support for the chest? I'm sure most ladies are familiar with what a corset is simply because I too would be afraid of them. They're not, they're not fun. Nobody likes being squeezed or choked slammed like one of the Undertaker's victims. Oof, no thanks, that guy's scary. The corset was a garment that went under the dress to help squish together everything. Tummy, chest, all into the desired look. Trouble is, well, they're tight, they're not comfy, and well, they can actually cause a lot of health issues, especially in warmer climates. Breathing becomes an issue and women have been known to faint. While not a dress itself, yes, I know, but for hundreds of years, it did go with every dress. So I say that counts because you couldn't wear a dress without one. Number nine, muslin disease. This one is just crazy, man. Okay, let's take a look back at the 18th and 19th century France, where there was a law against the peasant class wearing more than four kilograms in weight of clothing. Ooh, what? Thus preventing the lower class from owning higher quality fabrics that were strictly reserved for the rich and wealthy. Ooh, that's scandalous. So a lot of times women would disregard their undergarments, which that is crazy enough alone. However, what's really crazy is that they would wear muslin dresses, which were often dampened with water before going out to have a light, breezy, and cool outfit to wear in the summer. Plus, it was kind of see-through, so you could kind of see all the, the curves in all the right places. The trouble is, sometimes these light fabrics were wetted down and worn in less than prime weather conditions, and some people, well, they got really sick. It was actually suspected to be the reason for the 1803 influenza outbreak in Paris. Was it? Maybe, did it contribute? Probably, but not the main reason. Still though, that's crazy. Number eight, the hobble skirt. I'm not gonna come out here and pretend that I know a whole lot about fashion, cause folks, I don't. Heck, if it's plaid, simple, or well, it's, if it smells clean, I'm, I'm probably just gonna wear it. I like my clothes to feel free so I can have movement, so I can do all the crazy antics I do here on this channel. I hate being confined, and I imagine a lot of women feel this way too, so I can just imagine how much fun wearing the hobble skirt is. Not a lot of fun. A long skirt that has a more narrow bottom, specifically designed to enable the user's movement, because 
Well, you know, God forbid a woman wants to keep a brisk pace in the summer or something. The crazy part is there's stories of women falling and tripping and getting hurt from the hobble skirts, and in extreme cases, even fatal, which Maybe we should stop wearing them. We, we kind of have. Which to me, that just says it all. Rose in 1997's Titanic is actually wearing one where she trips and stumbles. Oh, see, look at that. I made a movie connection there too. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Number seven, Shields Green. Ever since humans started wearing fabric, we've wanted and found ways to stylize and color. It's what we do. The Romans, oh, how opulent they were. They loved purple. The Egyptians, now they love blue. Folks living in the Victorian era, they loved green. To be specific, a particular shade of green. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in the lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy. Flinga Forga Borgen. That's what they do in the lab. That's what I was told. I don't know. Or make Ikea furniture. This color was used in everything. Dresses, fabric, paint. As the valley girls would say, it's totally in. The trouble is, it was comprised of a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and it actually caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. The most famous case was Napoleon Bonaparte, when he was banished to St. Helena, the walls in his house were painted with the shade of Shields Green. It might have actually contributed to him uh, him passing. He died of stomach cancer, so he passed away of stomach cancer, so it might have contributed. Number six, pestilence. This could really be any time in history, considering how many viruses have gone around in human history, but this was an issue in Victorian times. Cities were growing larger, especially with the Industrial Revolution firing on all cylinders. It must have been a crazy time to be alive. For the rich, they mostly dodged that, but not always. In the case of laundry, well, wealthy people couldn't be bothered to do their own laundry. I mean, they're wealthy, that's what they do. And sometimes would have them washed and taken by launderers who washed their clothes with the rest of the city. Being that the clothes were washed with the rest of the clothes or washed by those in poor areas, there was a lot of sickness going around at the time and, well, they're contagious. A lot of times the illnesses would cling to fabrics and when given back to their customers could very well come down with whatever London was feeling at the time. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun because it wasn't a lot of fun. It's kind of like the silent, the silent undoer. Not good. Yeah, gross. So you put on your dress, next thing you know, you're in bed for three weeks and you croak. Number five, beetle dresses. There's been a lot of crazy dresses in history. I mean, Lady Gaga alone would be the whole list at this rate. The meat dress was insane in my opinion. I mean, can you imagine wearing a whole meat dress? How bad that would smell after an hour in the hot California sun? Ooh, no thanks. Plus, not to mention all the other weird and wacky things celebrities have worn. It's, there's just too many to mention. I'm here all day. Well, what if I told you a dress from the past rivals some of our modern craziness? Hard to believe. There was a trend in the 19th century to sew beetle car paces right into their dresses. That's the that's the hard stuff on the bugs and the and the vertebrae and all that gross stuff. Ooh, gross things. Similar to how women of ancient Egypt would crush the colorful bugs up to make a makeup, these were sewn into the dresses to make some sort of weird, freaky, colorful embroidery. And to be fair, it looks good, but ah, I'll pass. What are you wearing tonight? I'm wearing the cockroaches I found in my basement. Oh yes. <laughs> Gross. Number four, crinoline. Crinoline is an underskirt frame made from tough horse hair to form an almost bell-shaped cage that will go underneath the dress in order to give the wearer a much fuller and royal look. You've seen them before, you know, those big cages. You've seen them. Now, besides the fact that you're literally walking around in a cage, which I honestly can't think of a better metaphor for women in the 18th and 19th centuries to break free from, but there's one main issue that I cannot get over. You're going to get in the way of stuff. Just That's just how it's gonna happen. Happen. Trying to get into doorways, carriages, really anything would be difficult when you've got a lot of extra hip there. It's, it's not cool. Also, not to mention, the fabric may get caught in something, such as machinery, which, as some stories tell us, may have actually happened and could possibly have been fatal, which that's not a good way to go. There's good ways to go. That's not one of them. Talk to the chief, not it. Number three, aniline dye. The year was 1856 and life was great, or not so great depending on who you ask. If you ask a rich guy, it was probably good. A poor guy, probably not. There was lots of illnesses to be had and lots of folks had siblings who perished young from being ill. Everyone's got a story like, uh, my sister, right, she never made it, but she never made it. She's not here anymore. Anyway, William Henry Perkin was a man on a mission to cure as many illnesses as he could. Many Imperial soldiers were feeling a lot of those illnesses at the time, specifically malaria. He was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. Hmm. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye. So task failed successfully, I guess. It was a dye that makes deep reds, purples, and even black. Ooh, naturally this picked up a lot of steam, or paint roller, I guess, because 
dye funny color. Ha, <laughs> good joke. Anyway, and it began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. The trouble is, once people got enough exposure to clothing with aniline dye, their skin would go red, itchy, and severely inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb through their skin and their bloodstream and poison their blood. That's bad. That's not good. We don't like that here. Sure, there's bad outfits out there, but blood poisoning? Yeesh. Ugh, no thanks. Number two, cellulose nitrate. You take some nitric acid, you take some sulfuric acid, you mix it together and run it through some flammable material or a medium such as cotton, and bada bing, bada boom, literally, you got yourself some cellulose nitrate. The process was commonly done on clothes back in the late 19th century, which is just an awful idea. Some people might think it's because you're wearing volatile compounds, which is very true. That that's very true. But imagine a warehouse full of garments treated with this stuff. Uh-oh, not good. Especially considering how unstable it is. Chemistry fans will agree with me when I say while it's different, it's actually very similar to nitroglycerin, which was used to detonate large rocks and pathways when the railroads were being built across the nations. Canada and the US, of course, I'm talking about. It wasn't good. A lot of people got hurt in that one. Wasn't good. Number one, the revenge dress. We've talked about a lot of naughty stuff on this list and on this channel, so it's time for some levity. What's the deadliest dress out there? Well, that would have to be Princess Diana's revenge dress. Ooh. Worn by Princess Diana after her husband, Prince Charles, publicly admitted to an affair. What? Scandalous. Which, for royals, is a big no-no. You kind of can't really do anything without the media noticing. This dress is also lethal because, well, there's a good chance Diana maybe sort of kind of was done in by the royal family a couple years after she wore the dress. It, was, it wasn't too long after that. Plus, if it's called the revenge dress, I mean, come on, she was out for revenge. She was out for the, out for the blood. That counts, sure, a little bit of fun. 